snow capital of the United States of America. Late November, Thanksgiving week actually here in the US. And we've had a bit of a reprieve from some very cold, windy, wet weather and a rough end to our fall. And uh, it's not particularly warm. It's in the upper 40s, tickling on 50 degrees, but the winds are mild. And you'll come to find if you live in areas of the Northern Hemisphere, especially ones that really struggle with inclement weather like we do, that you're going to want to take those small windows of opportunity where it is rideable and safe outside and jump on it because it's it very monotonous to be stuck on the end of a trainer. So I'm enjoying, we'll call the scenery, a lot of bare trees as you can see. It's not terribly ugly but it's definitely not as scenic as the, the nice beautiful colorful leaves we saw in weeks past. Although our winter snowy weather leaves for very pretty trees and snow, it's not really safe to drive on. So I'm gonna take what I can get, doing a nice, easy endurance ride, hanging out, talking to you, thanking, uh, thanking the stars above that I don't have to spend another day on Zwift. So on the subject of Zwift, I wanna talk about uh, the platform, the love-hate relationship that many of us cyclists and truck have with watching our digital avatar float through a magical land in Lycra. And it's a setting that is extremely widely misunderstood and is the source of a lot of debate and dissension when it comes to conversations about Zwift. And you'll find this come up probably daily in forums, in Facebook groups, YouTube videos. And it's the idea of trainer difficulty. And I want to use this video to try to demystify and debunk a lot of the misconceptions about how it works give people a general understanding of what the setting is so that you can make a decision on how to manipulate it and use it to get what you want out of the platform. So let me get home where it's warm, where my mouth doesn't feel like it's going numb and I'm gonna drool all over the place because, you know, that's attractive. But we'll sit down and we'll have a little fireside chat. Okay, 40 miles in the bank. We are home getting warmed up. It got a little bit chilly, especially towards the end, dipping into the low 40s. We're at that point where we're bridging fall into winter and the fall gear is a tad on the light side, especially if you're sensitive to cold, but the winter gear is definitely too much. So as your speeds start to tick up a little bit and the wind starts cutting through your clothing, it gets a little cold. So I was trying to keep the speeds lower, seek out maybe some, some light gradients, keep the body heat and the core temperature up. But uh, towards the end, I was just ready to get inside and get warmed up. So now we're gonna talk about the uh, counterpart to outdoor training and that's our friend Zwift over here for indoor training. And we're gonna talk about this uh, setting called trainer difficulty. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with it. It's one of the most highly misunderstood. Look, I got a ride on, I'm not doing anything. Uh, it's the most highly misunderstood um, trainer setting in Zwift. It's very highly um, debated. Uh, it's a very contentious argument. You'll find this in um, you know Facebook groups and forums. And there's a lot of bad information out there. So the point of this video is to kind of demystify some of this, talk about what trainer difficulty is, what it isn't, the background, how you might want to manipulate it, and uh, try to debunk some of the uh, bad information that's out there. So real quick while I'm in here, let me just show you where the setting is. Um, if you open up your men uh, menu in a ride and you go down to your settings or your gear icons down here, this should look the same pretty much any platform you're using, whether it's mobile, Apple TV, or PC, it might be laid out a little differently. But your settings are, are kind of like your interface settings. These really don't have any bearing on how your avatar looks, but this is basically how you interface with Zwift. So I have this laid out here. I set my trainer difficulty to the default, uh, just for the purpose of this video. So it's about dead center, it's 50% trainer difficulty, um, and you have this ability to manipulate it one way or another. So typically, I will set my trainer difficulty to maximum. So that is 100%. 
So what does that mean? So this is kind of what we're gonna talk about here. What the trainer difficulty means, what 100% is, what 50% is, what 0% is, and uh, we'll go from there. So in order to unpack this idea of trainer difficulty, we're gonna have to rewind a little bit and talk about how Zwift works in general, um, the inception of the smart trainer, how you interface with the platform, and then what the trainer difficulty is intended to do and how you can manipulate it. And then we'll also talk about, well, who gives a shit, right? Why is this important? Why is this controversial? So we'll get in that in a few minutes, but let's start with how Zwift works. So in the beginning, Zwift was really something just pretty to look at. I wanna say it's been about six years now. I actually used this back in beta and it was revolutionary at the time, but it's really simple compared to what it is now. It was just something to look at. It would communicate with your Ant Plus devices much like it does now and it would take your speed and your cadence and basically just move you through the world. There really were no extra bells and whistles at the time. It was just something better than the, uh, the, the two-dimensional maps on like the Cyclops app at the time or Trainer Road at the time. And it just gave you something else to look at. And the idea was to make that social, to be able to combine all of these people who were riding their bikes and put them in the same world probably not having any clue that it would grow to be what it is today. But with the inception of the smart trainer, it, it evolved, the social construct evolved into a more robust training tool. And they were able to give this feedback feed forward from this awesome technology in the smart trainer that was becoming more and more accessible to the consumer market with pricing coming down to a more uh, accessible range. And they integrated that into their world, basically saying, hey, now we can talk to our customer. We can talk to our person on the bike. They can tell us what their power is if they don't have a power meter. Now the smart trainer can do that. And we in turn can tell them what they're seeing on the world is, is now interpreted into kind of a, a, a computation that the trainer can match. So if you see yourself going uphill, now your, your resistance on your trainer gets harder. It gets harder to pedal, much like it would on the real road. And if you're going downhill, it gets easier to pedal or you even coast and it, and it gets to the point where you're almost spinning out and running out of gears. And if you're on a flat road, you're somewhere in the between on effort and you're moving at a pretty stable speed and you can move pretty quickly. And they've taken several years to kind of work out these computations in physics and they've gotten pretty reasonably close. We're still not including things like wind or a whole lot in terms of rolling resistance, but it's a pretty decent approximation without all these extra uh, variables of how quickly you would go on the road. Now, your speed of your avatar is a calculation of you, your input against the world. So your input would be your weight that you put in your profile which is converted to kilograms, and then your power, which is generated by either your, uh, your power meter on your, your pedals or your crank or your wheel, or your power that's built into your smart trainer. Uh, you could also use power, the Z power, the digital power, but for the purposes of this video, that's really not relevant because we are talking about trainer difficulty. But at any, in any instance, your power in watts versus your weight in kilograms, your watts per kilogram, gives that that equation or the mathematical construct how Zwift takes it into their algorithm and how quickly it moves your avatar through space. And then it calculates it against the terrain changes. How quickly would a 50 kilogram rider at 100 watts go on a flat road? How quickly can they go at a 5% grade, a 10% grade, a 15% grade? And then how fast they would go downhill? Arguably, the flat roads and the inclines are pretty accurate. The downhill with turns and whatnot are arguably much less accurate. But for all intents and purposes, we're pretty close. It, they've gotten pretty good at, at tailoring in similar speeds that you would see on the road. You're not going 30 miles an hour on a flat road in Zwift and only going 18 on the real world road with the same power. So now that we understand how that works, it's important to know that regardless of what you do to your settings, that really will not change. Uh, your power or your watts per speed won't change. There are some uh, elements in terms of picking different equipment, different bikes and power-ups that will make marginal differences, but removing that from the equation, all other things being equal, if riders are on the same bike, on the same terrain, in the same watts per kilogram, they will be going the same speed. So 
one of the arguments in terms of trainer difficulty is that people talk about, well, it doesn't matter if you set it at zero or 100, you will not go any faster or slower. That is 100% the truth. So keep that in mind as we continue to discuss in this video. Nobody is saying anything in terms of your speed changing when you change that slider up or down. The next thing that's important to understand when we get into this idea of talking about trainer difficulty and the variation with those different sets of difficulties is what is power? How is it generated? What does it mean when you produce a watt on your bicycle? Because understanding that will make this idea of trainer difficulty and manipulating that setting a lot more clear to understand and then you can manipulate it for your needs more appropriately. So power is known by physics, it's a law or an equation that is not something that we can argue is a function of force or torque times velocity. That's it. Force times velocity equals power in watts. So we'll start with force. Force is how much pressure or torque you need to put into the pedals in order to create motion. It's measured in newtons. It's not something that we usually break down or we look at. It's just for you to understand, it's how much force or pressure or torque you're putting in to your pedals in order to move the bicycle. The other half of that is velocity, and velocity is a function of distance over time. So that's really best understood by cadence, how quickly you move your feet on the bike. Now, there are a lot more parts of the, the process in terms of rolling resistance and crank length and things that you can delve into if you really want to get into power in terms of physics. But for the sake of understanding and ease for this video without getting overly scientific with it, basically your power in watts is a computation of how quickly you're moving those legs by way of your cadence and then how much force or torque you're putting into those pedals as you're moving those legs. So there's more than one way to skin a cat, right? You can produce 200 watts on your bike with 95 RPM or 65 RPM. At 95 RPM, you have a lot more or a lot less pressure built up in your legs and you're completing that equ equation of force times velocity with more leg speed. Whereas at 65 RPM, you're applying a lot more force and you may feel more tension in your legs but you have much less leg speed. And this starts to rely on different systems, different physiological systems. At a higher cadence, you're able to be more reliant on your cardiovascular system and uh, your aerobic capacity, whereas is a lower uh, leg speed or lower cadence, you are more reliant on your muscular endurance and strength, your brute strength in your leg muscles. So this concept is really important to keep in mind going forward. It's not really something that should be argued. It's something that if you haven't even seen the science or the research behind how this works, from experiential and anecdotal perspectives, you know this to be true. You've likely experienced the difference between grinding out power on a hill that forces you in a low cadence versus being able to spin up and how much less pressure you feel in your legs or what different systems you may use in order to produce that power. So now that we've established all of our premises that are gonna be important when we talk about trainer difficulty, let's talk about what trainer difficulty actually is. Trainer difficulty is quite simply the resistance bias sent to your trainer by Zwift. Zwift will tell you it takes a bias against the gradient provided by their platform and will adjust it proportionately to your trainer difficulty setting. So at 100%, the resistance interpreted by your trainer is as true to life as possible by the system and the algorithm and your trainer uh, accuracy. Now for the purpose of this video, we're gonna assume that we're gonna use a, uh, a newer model our new generation direct drive trainer capable of up to 20% gradient simulation, which will capture pretty much anything on Zwift. Because it gets very complicated when we start talking about wheel on trainers that only go up to 10% and how that calculation works. It's a completely different animal. We're just talking about how this system works as designed. So what does that mean? At 100% trainer difficulty, if you hit a 10% gradient, your trainer will interpret that 10% and add the resistance commensurate with 10% on the real road. You can argue how accurate that interpretation may be. In my experience, it's been pretty close. It requires the same type of shifting, the same type of adjustment in power and body position. It's pretty damn close. 
If you were to take that trainer difficulty and move it down, reduce the bias to your, resist, uh, your, your trainer resistance. If you take that down to 50%, which is actually the default uh, in your settings through Zwift, that will now simulate a 5% grade rather than a 10% grade. At about 25%, it'll be 2.5% grade, 75% will give you 7.5% grade, and so on and so forth. Turning it all the way down to zero will mean that the resistance will not change and you're basically just free riding on the trainer. It is that simple. There's no reason to overcomplicate that concept at all. Now, trainer difficulty set to 100% is working on the premise that you want as accurate to real life simulation and immersive experience as possible. If you do not, this video and this argument may not apply to you, but if you're looking to ride in Zwift and practice for hills and climbs like they would be in the real road, being at 100% is, is designed to give you that closest estimation. You're gonna see this argument that trainer difficulty is like virtual gearing. That is not true at all. That is not what it's intended to do. You will hear people say, I use my uh, trainer difficulty at 25% or 50% because I don't feel like shifting or uh, I only have a 25 tooth in the rear and I, I want a 28. Arguably, you can manipulate trainer difficulty to offset some insufficient gearing if you understand the math and how it works. So if you have an 1125 cassette in the rear, but on your road bike, you have an 1128. You don't feel like buying a new cassette, but you wanna go climb Alp to Zwift and 1125 just isn't gonna cut it for you. In order to simulate and give yourself that little extra reach in terms of your gearing, you would take the ratios and the differential between your gearing. So between, uh, the, let's call it a compact in the front, a 34 tooth uh, front chain ring and a 25 tooth cassette in the rear. And the differential between that and a 34 front chain ring to a 28 in the rear, the differential in a gear ratio is I believe somewhere around 12%. So you could arguably take that trainer difficulty down to between 85 and 90% and get a pretty decent representation that in that easiest gear, you're gonna behave a little more like you have an 1128. It's perfectly fine to do that. As long as you understand where that's coming from, you know that you'll get a reasonable approximation of the real road. If you crank that down to 40%, that's fine, that's your business, you can do what you want, but if, you're gonna, if you go out on the road and you experience those same gradients and your cadence is so drastically di different and you're surprised by that, it's because you're cheating the hill a little bit with the trainer difficulty. You can ride Zwift however you want to do that. If you want to practice uh, exerting power at higher cadences or have something better to look at, that's more than your right to turn that trainer difficulty down. But assuming that you want to ride as close of an approximation to the real road as possible. You want to keep that as clo close to 100% as possible and fine tune those adjustments in a way that makes sense. So do the math if you've got a gearing issue and make that adjustment. Um, the reason that this becomes contentious is not necessarily so much in terms of a person's everyday riding, but when it ta starts talking about king of the mountain or queen of the mountain or more, uh, more probative to that is racing, is this idea, is there an unfair advantage to people who set their trainer difficulty lower? Arguably, there is. And that is because we're talking about repeatability and talk, going back to the systems that we use to produce power at different cadences that balance between uh, cardiovascular and uh, your muscular endurance systems. We talk about this idea of burning matches, which is really endemic to your, your muscles and how your muscles need to fire and having to, to put a, a high amount of torque into the pedals over and over again. Uh, can be very difficult and the repeatability starts to go go down. So let's say you're going uh, through a, a loop, a 10 mile loop, and there is a 15% grade every single one of these loops. You might be grinding up that hill at 65 RPM at 100% trainer difficulty. And by the fourth or fifth time, your, your legs feel like they're going to explode. But then you can turn that trainer difficulty down to 25% and you're spinning up there at 95, 100 RPM. It's a lot more repeatable because you're using a different system to offset that torque in your leg. You're not, your legs, you're not burning those same matches by doing that. So yes, there is an advantage. Unfortunately, we cannot offset a lot of the different advantages across the board because not everybody's on the same trainer. 
not everybody's on the same equipment. Not everybody is being honest about their weight. I mean, when we talk about racing in Zwift, we have to take it as a grain of salt, and with a grain of salt rather, and understand that there's gonna be people who cheat, there's gonna be people who, we're not saying that trainer difficulty is cheating, it's just people have an advantage due to their settings, due to their equipment, due to what they're using. It's gotta be a good workout and you've just gotta do it for the fun of it and understand that. It kind of at face value, yes, there is an advantage at riding at a lower trainer difficulty. Yes, you have to produce the same amount of watts regardless of your trainer difficulty to be able to keep up with the group, but your repeatability and your muscular fatigue will be drastically different. That is fact. And if you if you take yourself out of Zwift and we stop manipulating the system in terms of a game and thinking about it in terms of a game, if you just think about your physiology and how your body functions on the road with your cadence and your force and your power, you'll, you'll know this to be true. So if what I'm saying about trainer difficulty is true, why have a slider at all? Why manipulate that at all? There are a ton of good reasons that you might want to manipulate this trainer difficulty. And it's not about being unfair. It's not about, you know, cheating or trying to make things easier for yourself. This is a training tool. This is meant to be fun. This is meant to be a good workout and good exercise. And there are a lot of reasons why a person would want to move this slider anywhere on that uh, realm, all the way down to zero even. Even on a smart trainer, having that down to zero might be what you need for your particular ride. Knowing that it's there and how it works will allow you to use Zwift to your advantage as the best training tool for you. I already listed an example, making some mild uh, adjustments at the top end to be able to offset some insufficient gearing is absolutely a good uh, use of the trainer difficulty setting. It's, it would be better to have your bike on the trainer setup as close to the real road as possible, so you don't really have to manipulate that or offset that. But we all have budgets, we all need to save a couple of dollars, and as opposed to spending another 60 to $80 on a cassette, you just want to tweak this a little bit, completely understood, makes perfect sense. Go ahead and do that, but make sure you understand the ratios and the math so that you do it properly, so that you're not cheating yourself, so that you're not training insufficiently to what you're gonna find on the road. If you're training for a hilly race and you've got that trainer difficulty set down too low, you might have a system shock when you go hit those same grades on the road and say, man, this is so much harder on my muscles than it was on Zwift. It's not a Zwift problem, it's a setting problem. The next thing is injury. If you're coming back from injury, especially to your joints, namely your knees, even if the real road would throw a 15% grade at you that you're gonna have to grind on, it's probably not smart to, to use that on Zwift so that you're just going to exacerbate your inner injury. Turn that down. Find a good sweet spot for you. Figure out what terrains you're gonna ride, what you wanna ride. There's nothing to say that you can't go ride Alp to Zwift if you don't have this turned up all the way. Maybe you wanna still challenge yourself to put out that power and get a good speed, but you just can't do that low cadence. Turn that down to 50%, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You're not cheating anybody else. You're not cheating yourself. It's just doing it with purpose and function. You, you understand why you want that trainer difficulty down for your needs and your training. That's perfect, that's an awesome way to use it. Intervals. You know, we, we try to do intervals on Zwift because it makes it a lot easier to have something to look at, have flow through space, but maybe you don't have it programmed into a workout. The workout modes completely negate incline, but maybe you have your own workout that you want to do, or you don't want to use erg mode, or you don't want to use workout mode, and you just want to flow through the world, but you don't want all of these oscillations uh, in incline. You maybe turn that down or completely off. So you go through the world and you just ride your own power, but you've got some nice scenery going by your face and, and it makes it more enjoyable and it makes the time pass a little bit faster than having your nose into your head unit. That's a great way to use it. If you're new to cycling, if you're trying to learn how to climb, some of these hills on Zwift are, are pretty intense. They're tough for even the most uh, extreme cyclists out there. You know, I've, I've been on Zwift where I'm going up a difficult climb, uh, KOM or Innsbruck or um, even Alta Zwift, and you see these people new that are trying to challenge themselves, breaking down and coming to a complete stop on the hill because it's hard. It's really hard, especially if they're on a smart trainer and the thing just completely locks up on them and they can't even turn the pedals over because once you get under 40 RPM, forget it you're done turning it down as you build your power and you build your proficiency on the bike awesome 
man, make it make it a goal to start kicking that up a little bit week over week. Maybe today you did that tough KOM at 25%. Next week, maybe you'll do it at 30% and move your way up over time and start to take a little bit more as your power grows and you're able to get more control of your cadence and the torque and the pedals. Work your way up and then eventually you'll be able to get up that hill without breaking down, without having to stop, without having to get bogged down in your gears. There's a ton of ways to use this trainer difficulty to make the most out of your training. But what's important and which is the purpose of this video is understand what it is so that you can manipulate it properly to meet your training needs. Now, one of the arguments against what I'm saying that you might see out there is that if it was that much of an advantage, if it was that critical, why wouldn't Zwift lock this out for racing? And I understand what people are saying, but it really is kind of a moot point because Zwift doesn't lock out a lot of things that can provide an unfair advantage in racing. Because Zwift is a game and a social platform first, and it's just starting to kind of come into this eSport, which is really in its uh, infancy. And it's starting to provide itself as a platform for that to be possible. But the way that things are laid out, this is a setting for the game. This is something that runs in the background and is not set by race. And I can tell you right now, for, Zwift wants to make sure that this is accessible for everybody. They want people on cheap equipment, expensive equipment, they want people new to the sport or experienced racers to all be able to come on here and have a good time. They don't want to lock anything out to the point where it's going to exclude a big portion of their customer base. But I can tell you, when it comes to sanctioned races as things evolved and we find more ways to control these things, it is going to be, this is going to be one of the first things that gets locked out. So we're going to have people on if not identical equipment, uh, similar equipment. They might have to do these races on site, have the equipment calibrated, some kind of proof of that, verification of weight, verification of height. So this weight and height doping doesn't come into play with people who want an unfair advantage. They're going to probably see people on uh, similar equipment in the game in terms of bikes. I think anything in the game is probably going to be fair play, but they might decide that they want to put everybody on the exact bike so that there is no argument for what's a, a unfair or fair in the game if there's some kind of bug or issue there and then they're going to talk about this trainer difficulty guaranteed because people are gonna be on equipment, on a bike, they're gonna choose their bike and their gearing based on what they would choose on the road, and they're gonna lock this out. I guarantee you, within the next year or two, you're gonna see this trainer difficulty locked out. It's either gonna be set at 100% default or 50% default, but the bottom line is that everybody in that race is gonna be forced to the same resistance bias, and there's not gonna be one person that's turning it down to zero and just spinning away, and one person out of the saddle really wrenching on their handlebars and really getting down and dirty with trying to get up a really, really hard incline. But I want you to understand the purpose behind making this video is not in any way to insinuate that you are doing something wrong, that you, what you do in terms of your trainer difficulty isn't the right way to do it. That's not at all the case. What I wanna do is to give people an understanding of how this works so that they can take their goal or their objective in terms of riding on Zwift and be able to manipulate that setting accordingly so that they yield the results that they want. If you're changing that setting every single time you get on Zwift, good. That probably means you're doing something right. That means that you know that you have an objective that you need to reach and that that trainer difficulty is another tool for you to get there. There's no wrong way to ride on Zwift unless you're not having fun or you're not getting a good workout. So use that to your advantage, use that to meet your goals. And I hope that this has been helpful to give you a little bit more information on how to do that. I didn't wanna to get too far into the weeds in terms of the science and the, and the uh, physics of what's going on here. You know, if you wanna do some research, you will find that a lot of what I've mentioned here is very substantially backed up in, in cycling science and athletic science. Maybe not specifically to Zwift. Uh, I don't see a whole lot of research papers on Zwift, but I haven't really talked about Zwift specifically. There's a lot of stuff that I've left out in terms of how the algorithm works. And obviously there's room to grow in terms of uh, rolling resistance and wind that will probably start to be generated in the platform. 
but realistically, I'm trying to give a high level overview of how this works, trying to actually uncomplicate this. You know, I think people overcomplicate this or oversimplify it and you end up on these two extremes. I'm trying to just give you kind of the brass tacks right down the middle, how it works so that you get the best bang for your buck when you're on Zwift. Because the last thing I want to see, especially to people who are new on the platform or new to cycling in general, to get discouraged by bad information or to get discouraged by lack of results because they haven't set up the, the training tool to meet their specific needs. So if you guys have any comments, questions, concerns, clarifications, please feel free to leave them in the comments down below. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say down there. Please like this video if you liked it. Uh, it. It really does help out the channel. Hit the thumbs down if you think I'm an idiot. I'm sure I will get quite a few thumbs down for people who don't want to keep an open mind. But I hope if you're this far into the video, you have kept an open mind and a lot of this will make sense to you. Subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that goofy little notification bell if you want an obnoxious notification on your phone every time my ugly mug gets on here to start uh, talking and blabbing on to you guys about the next uh, annoying thing I wanna talk about. But thank you guys so much for watching and making it to the end of the video. I do appreciate your time. I hope you guys have a fantastic Thanksgiving and I will catch you in the next one.